I'll fly slope of LB. Uh, I take you know the difference in the y's. So three minus one would be two. Difference in the x's, three minus one again would be two. So there's my slope, right? Two or two, which is one. Uh, then I want to find the slope of uh, CD. And do the same thing. So two minus zero is two. Five minus three is two again. So that reduces to one. So that tells me now that uh, that and that are parallel, correct? Same slopes. So the next stage is, the next process is to do slope for LD. Okay. Uh, so then I go Y minus 1, which would be 1. And then um, X2 minus X1, so 1 minus 3 would be negative 2. So I get slope of negative 1 half. Now I'm going to do the same thing for slope BC. And uh, 3 minus 2 would be 1. And then 3 minus 5 would be negative 2. So again, I get negative 1 half. So that means that those two sides are parallel. Does that make that a parallelogram then? Okay. So the next part of this question asks you to deal with distances, right? I think it's a good idea to, if you're going to deal with distances and you've already dealt with slopes, is to use the information that you have found in slopes to help you find distance. And what I mean by that is if I take the slope formula, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? And I take the distance formula, which is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Do both these formulas incorporate the same components? There's a y2 minus y1 there, right? You just, instead of dividing that one. Right. So when I look at uh, a particular one of these, so let's look at a uh, slope of LB. My Y2 minus Y1 is 2, right? Yes. So then in my distance formula right here, I'm going to put a 2 there. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. And then we also have here an X2 minus X1 and in our distance formula. That's there. So in a particular problem then, Maybe it's that distance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, later, later, like, remind me that I have a question asking about. Okay. Not the paper, but the online All right. So when I find distance of LB, it's using this formula here, right? Okay. It's using this formula, but the Y2, the Y1, minus Y1, and the X2, minus X1, they are already found in the slope. Okay. So just take the numerator and square it, it gives me 4. Take the denominator and square it, it gives me 4. And that gives me radical 8, which eventually becomes 2 radical 2 if we simplify it. So what I want you to see is that when you do slope, you have done all of the calculations necessary to find distance. You just have to kind of rearrange them for the formula a little bit better, or a little bit different. Does that make sense? Or vice versa. If I would have done um, distance first, I do the x2 minus x1 and y2 minus y1. I've got then the components that are necessary for the switch formula. We'll get that. Um, does that make sense, everybody? I think when, when people start to do this, and I ask you, find all four slopes, and I say find all four distances, some people do legitimately eight calculations, which is okay, but you're doing four calculations redundantly. You're doing the same thing over and over again. You're finding the, uh, doing the same subtraction, the same order pairs, and you're wasting time. Okay, um, so now here's how I can e go even quicker now. If I want to find the distance of CD, is that using the exact same quantities from LB? CD is still using 2 and 2, right? So when I find distance CD, it's still going to be radical 8 or 2 radical 2. Is that all right with everybody? The only thing you got to pay attention to if you're going to use that, you have to do that process before simplification. If I go through the simplified version, uh, then my uh, x2 minus x1 that I'd be trying to use would be a 1, and my y2 minus y1 I'd be trying to use would be a 1, um, and I'd get radical 2 as an answer, which is half of what I wrote it for. I'm going for 2 radical 2, not 4 radical 2. Uh, so I have to do it before I reduce things, uh, but that's maybe a benefit of writing down your slopes and writing down the work uh, so that when you want to find distance, then it's, it's just pulling out those values and placing them in a different format. Yes, Carter? Uh, 
but so what you're saying is we should do those both at the same time? I would. Okay. Um, now, again, it's all dependent on how they try to structure the question for you. Uh, for instance, on that second one on the front, uh, we have, I think, this question here. And they say just focus on one pair of sides. So let's, let's focus on uh, just the top and the bottom. So if I focus, so focus on the orange ones, um, which are, let's show these points. If I focus on the orange ones, I'm going to find a slope. The slope of RQ would be, subtract the Y, so I get 6 minus 4 would be 2. And then subtract the X is 5 minus 2 would be 3, right? So slope is 2 thirds. Now if I want to find distance. Okay. No, wait, you found 3 as the slope, so you did the maroon ones. Okay. If I want to find the distance of this orange one, I now have the y2 minus y1, so I'll square that. And I have the x2 minus x1, so I'll square that. And I get 4 plus 9, which is 13. So that's how I find the slope and the distance using the same components. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to find the slope of p to s. All right, so slope of p to s. Yeah, 3 minus 1 is 2, 4 minus 1 is 3, so I get 2 thirds again, so they are parallel. And then because I'm using the same 2 and 3 inside this formula, when I take 2 squared and I take 3 squared, I still get distance to be radical 13. So I've also found that that's radical 13 and that's radical 13. So now Wait, I have shown you... now that one with one pair of opposite sides being parallel and I think parallel here. That means PQ needs to be radical 10. Okay, so you could have found PQ to be radical 10, and its slope would have been 3, right? And then RS is radical 10, and its slope is 3. So you could have looked at just the maroon ones or just uh, the orange ones and, and come up with that conclusion. It doesn't matter which set you look at. All right. I'll go back to where All right, so the, the next question was dealing with this one, right? Uh, basically, the way I structure the question is I ask you to look at the diagonals. And when the diagonals intersect each other, they partition one another. And partition is just a word for breaks up into groups, right? Or breaks up into parts. Uh, so the diagonals, when they intersect, partition the two diagonals into four parts. Basically, what I was trying to get you to do is figure out what those four parts are. Okay? Uh, in order to do that, in order to find those four parts, you need to figure out what this midpoint here is. Okay, where do these diagonals intersect? So they're intersecting here at A, and I've got to figure that point out. Um, and there's a couple different ways. You could come up with the equation for the red line, the equation for the blue line. That's probably the best approach. Uh, it's the most logical approach, I think, but that's right now going to be pretty time consuming. So let's do it this way. Let's think about let's first assume that this thing is a parallelogram. And by the work that we come up with later, uh, that assumption m can be verified or contradicted, okay? So if this is a parallelogram, that point right there, A, would be the midpoint of the red segment and the midpoint of the blue segment, right? Okay? So let's say I find the midpoint of the red segment. So I take 3 plus that 0, and I divide by 2, correct? So I take the average of the x's. So A is located at 3 halves. And now I take the average of the y. So 2 plus negative 2 gives me 0. Average that out, divide by 2, I get 0. So for the red line, I have found A to be located at 3 halves comma 0, right? If I look at the blue line, okay, so looking at S and U, add the x's together, you get 3, okay? Divide by 2, you get 3 halves again. Add your y's together, you get 0. Divide by 2, you get 0 again, right? So did I get the same midpoint? For the blue line as I did the red line. That makes sense to everybody? And when that happens, what we're saying then, I'm going to put another point in here real quick. When I put that point B in, it, should, it landed right on top of A, right? So what we're saying here is that this blue line 
is finding point A on the red one. Does that make sense? And if A is the midpoint of the red one, the blue one is bisecting the red one. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. When I look at the red one, the red one passes through the midpoint of the blue one, right? Which would be point B. Okay. So the red one is passing through the midpoint of the blue one. So the red one is bisecting the blue one. Does that make sense? So we've just shown that the blue one bisects the red one and the red one bisects the blue one. And the way we do that is we show essentially that their midpoints are the exact same point. That's enough to essentially say that this thing's a parallelogram. When you're able to show that the diagonal's midpoints are the same coordinate, the same set of coordinates, um, you have a parallelogram. And the logic behind that, the reason behind that, is if I were to find the distance from A to B, or not, sorry, A to R, and then find the distance from A to T. Let's see if we can do that real quick. A to R is 2.5. Sorry. A to R is 2.5. A to T is 2.5. Does that show that's been bisected? I go U to A, 4.92, and A to S, 4.92. Does that make sense? So that is enough to show that this thing has been bisected. And I want, it, I want you to, on that problem, to find these four distances. So this is how you would do this. And, and I wanted, my hopes were you left it as radicals. So this is three halves, comma, zero. And we're just going to do one of these distances. If you do one of them, you should be able to do all four of them. Let's say I want to find the distance between A and S. Okay. We'll find that distance. In order to find that distance, I need to look at point A, which is 3 halves, comma, 0. And I need to look at point S, which is 6, comma, 2, right? I'm looking at those two points. And find the distance, I'm going to subtract those things, right? So subtract the x's. Now, the issue here is that one of your x's is a fraction, and the other one is a whole number, right? Or an integer. What do I need if I'm going to add or subtract fractions? Make it decimal. Nope. We'll make it 6 over 1. Okay, so 6 over 1. And then what do I have to do? Nope. What do the denominators have to be if I'm going to add or subtract fractions? Okay, so this thing needs to be turned into 12 over 2. Okay, so we have a common denominator, right? So now when I do distance, I'm going to do x2 minus x1. So let's subtract those two things. In order doesn't matter. So I'm going to go 12 halves minus 3 halves gives you 9 halves. And you square that. Plus then, subtract your y's. You'll get 2, right? And you'll square that. Now, the reason I want to show this is because you're going to be asked to do this potentially in the course exam. Leave your answers using decimal, or sorry, decimal uh, fractions. Leave your answers as perfect, exact um, radicals. Okay? So, we fit stuff in there, and now we get some algebra that we, we have to realize. What does 9 halves squared mean? Yeah, when I square something, what does that mean to me? Okay, so that means 9 halves squared is 9 halves times 9 halves, right? So what is 9 times 9? 81. What's 2 times 2? 4. Okay. Now, we don't like generally writing that stuff there that I put a box around. Looking at what we started with, how can I get 9 halves to turn into 81 fourths with this power of 2? What did I really essentially do? Yeah, I, I, bit, I squared the numerator, right? Yeah. So whatever that power was, I did that to the numerator and got 81. And then I do that to the denominator and I get 4, right? Yeah. So when you square a fraction or you cube it or you raise it to the fourth power or whatever, you apply that power to the numerator and then the denominator. That's how you square a fraction. And then this has got to turn into plus 4, right? Yeah. If I got these two fractions and I want to add them together, what do I need? Okay, so it'll be over 1, so I multiply by 4 over 4, and it gives me 16. Good, so 16 over 4, right? So that is going to turn in when I add those together as radical 97 over 4, right? Have we talked where we can do this? We can take the right, if it's one fraction under the radical, we can actually break it up into two, two radicals. What's the square root of, let me get a little bit more room here. 
Let's actually do the work down here. I've got radical 97 over 4. We're going to rewrite that as radical 97 over radical 4. What's radical 4 the same as? Radical 2, no, 2 squared. Uh, 4 is 2 squared. So what you'd have is radical 2 squared like that, and that, that and that power are going to cancel out, right? Yeah. So it just leaves you just 2. Yeah. And the top is prime. 97 is prime. Yeah. So that right there is the distance between A and X. And they're going to ask you, can you do that? Can you leave your answer that? My hopes are is that at least setting up the, the blue distance where I've got the square root of 9 over 2 squared plus 2 squared, that everybody can do that. Everybody can apply that formula and use the geometry and make that argument. But if I can't get the rack of 97 halves, the end course exam is going to say that I'm not a very good geometry student, where that is not the case. Okay? When you can't get the 97, a root of 97 over 2, that tells us that you have an algebra issue. Does that make sense? You take this end of course exam um, to demonstrate that you are proficient and good at geometry. You have to demonstrate to show that you're good at algebra as well. Okay? Um, and, and and really, that's not algebra. That's like seventh, eighth grade math. Okay? With adding fractions, multiplying fractions, that kind of stuff. Um, so hopefully, we can do that. Uh, I know that becomes problematic just because of the the last eleven years teaching this stuff. Students struggle with that. Okay, uh, so as we move through the course, I'll try to refine those skills, help, help you deal with radicals, um, help you understand their, what they are and what we're doing with them. I think if you understand what they are um, in, in regards to being a symbol for another number, it allows you to kind of deal with them calculation-wise a little bit easier. All right, so that being said, this is, this is kind of what I was... Um, Hoping you would do on the last question uh, when it says, I'm going to leave it up to you which technique you want to use. When I look at um, you know, this picture here, this is the last question. Uh, my hopes were that most of us maybe did this. Found the slope of that one, slope of that one, slope of that one, and slope of that one, right? And recognize that opposite sides have the same slope, so it's parallelogram. Anybody use distance there? Okay, you could have used distance, but it's going to be longer work. It's going to be more time consuming. Not a problem, but it's, it just takes more time. What I hope we eventually do is use the idea that if I can find the midpoint of NO, so the midpoint of NO would be, let's see here, that point right there. Let me get rid of, I don't know. Why A is there. So the midpoint of NO is B, and the midpoint then of JH would be A, and they overlap each other. Okay. So if you find, so the midpoint of uh, NO, adding those X's together divided by 2 would give you 1, add the Y's together divided by 2 would give you 4. So I get 1, 4 is that midpoint, right? Well, if I go through and find JH's midpoint by adding the X's divided by 2, adding the Y's divided by 2, if I get 1, 4, again, I get the same midpoint two times. It tells me that those two things are bisecting one another. Does that make sense? Now, if I show you, maybe it's a little bit more obvious, a contradiction of that, okay? If I look at this shape, maybe. If I look at that shape, would you guys agree that that is, in fact, not a parallelogram, right? You see A is still the midpoint of JH, and B is still the midpoint of NO. But A and B are different, right? Because A and B are different, that means that those diagonals are not bisecting each other. So it's not a parallelogram. I can move this around. I can change this shape as much as I want. And I can get down to, you know, what if I make this thing a rectangle? A rectangle is a parallelogram. And what happened to A and B? A and B came, became the same point again, right? Okay. Huh? So a square? Well, a square is a rectangle, but this is going... Um, no, that's five and that's four, right? So now it's a square, and we're seeing that it's a parallelogram, right? Because that set of midpoints. But if I do this, not a square anymore, right? Okay. Um, once the midpoints diverge from one another, they don't, they're not the same anymore. You do not have a parallelogram. Is everybody all right with that? I think that's probably the quickest way for you. Uh, if if you have options, like I gave you an option on this last one, 
Okay, use any technique you want. I think that's probably the best. Uh, the last page gave you something like this. The first question gave you those blue points. Okay, negative one, two, three, three, and one, one. It said there's a fourth point that will complete this parallel Okay, what are the potential locations of that fourth point? Well, think about this way. Uh, this is the first one on the back. So it's, let's see here, it's this question here. It's the last page. So if this thing's going to be, with this fourth point in here, you know, where I put D right there, that's not going to be a parallelogram, right, if you connect all those things? But if I look at, say, that segment right there and that segment right there, if these are, if this thing ends up being a parallelogram, what would you know about those two solid lines? They'd have to be what to one another? What would those have to be to one another? Parallel. They'd have to be parallel. Okay. So this slope here from A to C is down one to the right two, correct? Down one to the right two. Or from C to A, it's up one to the left two, correct? So to go from B, to go from B to D, Shouldn't I have to follow the same pattern? Up, up one from B, and then to the left two to get to D. And that's going to force those two lines to be parallel, aren't they? So then when I, could, when I finish this shape, oh, when I finish this off, is that a parallelogram? So one potential place for D to go is 1 comma 4. Okay, but now think about this way. Could D be over here? Can you kind of visualize that being a parallelogram? Okay, so thank you. If, if that's a parallelogram, okay, shouldn't that segment maybe the segment B to D, shouldn't that be parallel to AC? And that's from A to C, that's down one over two. So from B to D, we should go down one over two. And that should be a set of opposite sides for a parallelogram. And that puts D at five comma two, right? Is everybody kind of visualizing this, seeing how this works? All right. And then the last position that D could be, would you make the argument that D could be down here somewhere? And I think it actually has to be at negative three zero for that thing to be a parallelogram. So those are your three options. Uh, for the location of the I see uh, math Excel will ask questions like this. It'll give you maybe two points for triangle and ask you uh, where could the potential third point show up? Maybe three points of a quadrilateral and ask you, or a parallelogram and ask you where are the potential places um, that fourth point can show up and so forth. Okay. Um, in order to do that, we have to understand some key facts about parallelograms in this case. The ones on the back, these were a little bit harder. It make you think, at least these two here. And we're only going to get through maybe talking about one of these. Um, but the idea here, the logic that's happening is we are taking out numbers. Okay, so this is all in the coordinate plane. But instead of dealing with the numerical values, we're going to take the numbers out and replace them with arbitrary values. Arbitrary meaning just variable. It could be anything. Okay. So the, the notation here, you're going to see this a lot. It's called analytical geometry, where we take numbers out and just start dealing with um, variables. What we're saying here, if I want to start at 0, 0 and go to this point right there, don't you first travel a distance of A units? Yeah. Okay, maybe it's 2 units or 3 units or whatever, but you're going to travel horizontally that far, right? And then to get to that point, I'm going to travel vertical distance of B. Is that okay with everybody? So that gives me the first point, AB. Maybe A, like I said, maybe A is 2 and maybe B is 3. So this point would be 2 comma 3. All right? But it, A could also be 5 and B could be 3. A could be 12 and B could be uh, 7. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. But that's how I would get to that point. Well, now if I want to start at 0, 0, and I want to get to this point over here, do I still have to travel some A amount to get to this point over here? 
thinking about how I want to travel from zero zero to there, I would start at zero zero and I start moving this way, right? Well, that's A, but now I've got to move a little bit further, right? So this portion here is a new distance, which is called C. So to get right underneath that point, I have to travel A and then C more. So that would be A plus C, right? Is it okay with everybody? And that's why that X coordinate is A plus C. I would then need to go up B to get kind of in line with that point. So that distance is B. But now I've got to travel a little bit more. So we're calling that D. Well, if that's B and that's D, that complete distance, the segment addition postulate says that distance should be B plus D, right? So my Y coordinate is B plus D. Is that doable for everybody? Okay. And then to get to this point, we do A plus C, but then we go a little bit further to the right. We're calling that a little bit further distance E. So A plus C plus E will get me that X coordinate. And then I go B plus D would get me there, plus F will get me all the way up there to that point. Is that doable? Does that kind of make sense what we're doing here? All right. So when they ask me, with these arbitrary values, I don't know what they are. I don't know what A, B, C, D, E, and F are. It could be all, you know, two, three, four, five, whatever numbers they want to be. But if I have these arbitrary values, can you still find slope? Can you still do Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1? If I say M or slope is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, could I consider... This, let's, let's find the slope of that line right there. Could I consider this, X, or sorry, Y2, come on, Y2, and call this Y1? Does that make sense to everybody? So then I'd have B plus F minus B. That's Y2 minus Y1. And then I can do X2. And that be x1. So a plus e, that's my x2, minus my x1, which is a. So what am I left with when I take b plus f minus b? What's b minus b? What's 3 minus 3? Zero. Zero. It's 12 minus 12. Zero. Zero. So it's b minus b. Zero. Zero. Those cancel out, leaving you just F. Okay? What happens with your A's down here? They give me zero, so zero plus E is just E, right? So the slope of this line right here is F over E. Okay? Which is nice because what that tells me now, as I change A, B, E, and F, they can be anything they want to be. What dictates that slope is simply F and E. Does that make sense? So I'll give, uh, give you a kind of a concrete example here. If, uh, let's say A uh, is located at 2 comma 3. So this point here is going to have a 2 in it and a 3 in it. So 2 plus something, comma, 3 plus something. Let's say that E is 5, and let's say F is 8. Okay? So that point is really 7, comma, 11, right? Does that make sense to everybody? So if it was really 7, 11, and it's just 2, 3. 7, 11, and 2, 3. I want to find a slope between those two things. It's 11 minus 3, right? Which would be 8. And 7 minus 2, which would be 5. five. Well, we just found it to be F over E, right? Yes. F was your 8. E was your 5. So I put 8 over 5, like that expression tells me to. So it's give me the same slope. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? So this F over E is telling me, essentially, the distance is telling me the rise and the run from that point to that point every single time. Okay? Um, but what's nice is it, it's a formula that, that allows us 
So move A, B, C, D, E, F, all those values around anything we want to. And if I can keep track of what F and E are, I always know the slope of that segment just by their proportion. Okay. Uh, tomorrow with GeoGebra, we'll, we'll investigate that a little bit more uh, in depth. But we can do the same thing now with this side over here. Okay, there's Y2. So I go B plus F plus D. There's Y1. So I go minus B plus D. Now it's a minus a product, or not a product, a quantity. So you got to put parentheses around that. And then I go X2, which is A plus E, minus A plus C. I'm sorry, this is A plus E plus C. I was missing that C right there. So A plus E plus C minus then A plus C. Now, because if, I, if I've done this correctly and I, I subtract a quantity, this numerator is going to be B plus F plus D minus B minus D. And the denominator is going to be A plus E plus C minus A minus C. What's going to happen with that B and that negative B? Good, they cancel out. What's going to happen with that D and that negative D? Cancel out. What are you left with up top? F. On the bottom, what's going to happen to that A and that negative A? Cancel out. What's going to happen with that C and that negative C? Cancel out. What are you left with? E. We just found that that slope is F over E. Is that slope the same as that slope? Yes. yes. So that component right there and that component right there are the only two things that dictate the slope of that line on the right. Okay. A, uh, C, and B, and D can be anything they want to. And G, F can be anything they want to. But on, on the slope, it's simply F divided by E. All right. uh, that's analytical. Uh, Geometry, we're going to deal with that quite a bit. If you uh, look at any of the open assignments, 6-7 is strictly that kind of stuff. Uh, but I want to kind of give you an introduction to it so you can maybe deal with it a little bit more uh, prior to getting to 6-7 uh, and have a little bit of understanding when we get there of what we're trying to do. Um, tomorrow, like I said, we'll probably talk about that with GeoGebra. Uh, and we can do the same thing again with the top and the bottom on those slopes. Uh, we can do the same thing with the uh, midpoint formula on that last portion, okay? Uh, last question, that's on There's no new homework tonight, uh, so you don't have to do anything that's in Math Excel right now if you don't want to. Um, maybe talk about 6-4 tomorrow, maybe talk a little bit about this stuff again. Um, but what I want you guys to understand, a lot of your formulas, y2 minus y1 and x2 minus x1, your distance formula, uh, even stuff that you've learned from algebra where your quadratic formula, you remember opposite e plus or minus b squared minus 4 ac or 2a, that kind of stuff. All of that stuff is developed by getting rid of concrete values, getting rid of numerical quantities, and inserting arbitrary values like a, b, c, okay, and working through a process that generates a formula, okay. So when we found slope, when we find slope, we do rise over run, initially, you know, we like to understand the concept with numbers, but if we get rid of the numbers and put in x1, y1 as an ordered pair, and x2, y2 as an ordered pair, and we do rise over run concept with it, we get the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. All right, it's a general formula then that says whatever x1, y1, x2, y2 are, this will always develop your slope. Okay? Um, so we're trying to get into some of the geometry that provides a little bit of insight on how formulas are created, where they come from why they are what they are, uh, and so forth.